Hello and welcome to my eighth video on the uh, plant-based weight loss video blog. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, first, a little exercise update. Earlier I did 15 minutes on my new exercise bike all in one stretch and uh, I ended up feeling a lot of pain from it again today but it wasn't as bad as it was yesterday already there's a, a little bit of an improvement there so I think this is going to work out really well um, my immediate goal is to build up to a minimum of half an hour a day six days a week and from there you know get up to an hour or more um, it's recommended that you try to exercise, you know, at least an hour or two a day. And ideally that is what I would like to do, both while I'm trying to get the weight off and afterwards. So, things are, are looking good there. Um, my main focus for this video was I wanted to talk a little bit about what created my food addiction, um, what made me become a, a, an overeater. And I know that everybody in this boat has a story and I know a lot of people have been through far worse than me, so this isn't a basis of comparison type of thing against anyone else. And I'm definitely not trying to find any pity or sympathy because now you know, I'm, I'm 43 and I'm captain of my own ship and, you know, hoping to still make something out of my life before it's too late and hopefully I can do that. But, uh, well, here goes. A um, little backstory about my family. I was born and raised for my first seven years in uh, South River, New Jersey, which from our backyard way off in the distance you could see the Statue of Liberty because we were kind of up on a hill and so from our backyard everything sloped down and so we had elevation and you could see the Statue of Liberty so it was very close to New York City. Um, my father was dead by the time I was six. He had a heart attack when I was three and I still remember the day, Sunday, he came home from the golf course early. Uh, I was sitting in the front room watching, I believe it was an old show on WOR called uh, Wonderama, the Sunday morning kids show. And in walks dad, holding a hand to his chest, and he was like, uh, Kurt, call for your call for your mom, and I was like, Mom! I was only three, I guess. Would have been 72, I think. So she came down, and he was complaining of chest pains, and I remember her calling the paramedics, and them coming to take him. And from then until he passed away, he was in and out of the hospital a lot. And uh, I believe that he died from internal bleeding complications from open heart surgery, but it was probably a combination of that and just general neglect uh, by the hospital staff. <clears throat> According to what he had said and what my mother remembers, he was not treated all that well in certain instances, so that may have contributed. I don't know, but I do remember that, uh, and also I should say that I'm the youngest of three siblings. I have two older brothers who are 16 and 18 years older than I am, and we're all from the same parents. So I've also heard some stories from my brothers about how my dad was especially when, when my brothers were young, pretty violent with my mom. There was abuse. Uh, they would get the belt all the time, even apparently at times they didn't really deserve it. 
and I know I certainly did a couple of times, although by then, between his age being nearly 50 and his illness, he uh, only spanked me a couple of times before he was gone. But he also did one other thing, which uh, I've never forgotten. And this would have been when I was still very young, and I don't remember if he was sick at this point or not. But what happened was, my uncle, my father's brother, and his wife, and uh, I think that was all. There may have been other family members, but we were having some sort of family dinner together. And uh, right from the beginning, as soon as I was out of the high chair and sitting at the dinner table with everyone else, I was getting portions of food which were close in size to what everyone else had. And I could, you know, give me anything, I could gobble it down. <laughs> and I was a fat kid almost immediately. I know that when I was given my little physical for pre-kindergarten, I was already well over four feet and well over a hundred pounds at the age of five. I was huge, you know. Not as obese as I became later on, but just big, stocky kid. And I ate. It was one of the things I did. I was bookish, loved looking through encyclopedias and books. I didn't have an easy time getting along with my peers because I was interested in things that they were not and vice versa. So, you know, it's just the kind of kid I was, lonely little nerd kid. And anyway, there was this one day with family members over and I had a plate full of stuff and there was just something I didn't want to eat, which was rare for me, but it happened. It wasn't even that I didn't like it because I had had it in the past. It was basically, a, my mom called it pot cheese and noodles. So there was some kind of cheese and egg noodles and a little bit of butter. And it, it the cheese gave it kind of a sweet taste. I, I don't know exactly what kind of cheese it was, but it was all right. And of course there was some meat thing and, and some other vegetable but I didn't want the noodles. And I started complaining about not wanting them and my dad was like, yo, yeah, you gotta eat, you know, gotta eat it, blah, blah. And I don't know what set him off. I wasn't even crying. I was just eating the other stuff on my plate, leaving the noodles alone. And finally I said, I'm just not eating this tonight or something to that effect. And he just snapped, grabbed me from my place at the table, and dragging me by one foot, drug me up the stairs to the bedrooms, and drug me into the bedroom, threw me on the bed, and uh, yelled at me and turned around and walked away. And the lesson I think I picked up from that was, from now on, if it's in front of you and it's yours and you're supposed to eat it, you eat it doesn't matter if you don't like it, doesn't matter if you're full. And very often I was definitely over full, being this, you know, little fat kid. I was eating too much and spending too much time with my nose in a book and not enough time outside. So, you know, from this, from that point onward, I've always been a plate cleaner, compulsive almost even now that I, I can, <clears throat> can generally, excuse me, I can generally measure myself out a portion that I know is, is pretty much the right amount for me. When I'm done with it and there's just a little sauce or whatever on the bottom of the bowl or the dish, I just have to stick a finger in there and get it all up and move them. So yeah, you know, that, that kind of set the stage. And uh, as I got older, you know, my father passed away, and then my mother just, my mother was already very OCD, obsessive compulsive. 
she was uh, a serious smoker and I think that uh, at one point she was hooked on Valium which can't be good but uh, she also even as early as when I was a toddler always looking for an excuse to go out to a church bingo game so she was a gambler and from what I understand my father made her work her own job so she could have money to fritter away because he wasn't going to have any of it and given the way she was about all this stuff that much I can understand and I take uh, his side 100% for you know I, I know that it had to be very difficult for him to stay with my mom but that doesn't excuse the violence and the beating it was just dysfunctional all around so as I got older you know and my my mother just really deteriorated <clears throat> excuse me once again I have a frog in my throat she really deteriorated and uh, going to bingo games every chance she could it became once we came here to Vegas when I was 13 in 1982 whatever money was left over about 30,000 or so from the sale of our house and all the moving around that we did I, I played hopscotch all over the country from when I was seven until I was 13 you know whatever money was left it got thrown away on uh, video poker machines in a matter of months and we went from coming to Vegas and having enough money to maybe buy a uh, double wide and a trailer park to live in which wouldn't have been that bad I mean not every trailer park is full of you know stereotypical trashy people there's some in Vegas that are okay you know, we went from maybe doing that to having no money and my mother uh, taking me with her to the housing authority. Now, I, I should backtrack here a little bit. She uh, hurt herself on the job not long after I was born, tripping over something, I think a rope. And she did some permanent damage to her neck and back and had to go on disability. And that fight lasted a very long time and her employer was very adversarial about the whole case and uh, it took her a while to get disability but that's what she ended up with plus then she got social security benefits for my dad and also a check for me until I turned 18 and it wasn't a lot of money but back in the 70s and 80s it was enough to get by on and by the time we got here to Vegas like I said there I remember looking at ATM receipts when she would have me go up and draw out the daily 500 to throw away in the casino and the balance that's the the start of that was over 30,000 and we went from that to trying to get into subsidized uh, Section 8 housing which was not good. I mean the apartments there were to choose from were in bad neighborhoods and that was a shock to me because until that time I'd always lived in, in a nice middle class kind of house so that was a bit of a shock and uh, over time you know she started drinking too that was terrible uh, she was one of those types of people who well first of all was a terribly mean drunk a lot of the time I can remember depending on which day I would either have her in my face crying and going on and on oh I just want you to be happy oh Blah, 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 you know just gibberish a lot of it to other days the what am I gonna do when you turn 18 and I don't get the money for you how will I afford to live oh so you mean I'm just a check to you then that's nice to know I I 
feel so important now. Thank you, Mom. To the all but the vomiting up the pea soup exorcist style. Go to hell! <laughs> Growling, just... Uh, and, uh... There were only a couple of stretches from when I was nine or ten until I was, uh... 16, maybe, and not too far away from just leaving home, which I did a little after I was 18, I think, or maybe 19. I was trying to go to college and live in that environment, and between the environment and my completely destroyed self-esteem at that point in my life, college didn't go very far. But those are just the things I remember. And, uh, so my escape was to find things to eat. I took comfort in eating. I was active since we didn't have a car. Uh, later on, the car that we had just kind of broke down and, and that was that. So I, I got around on a bike and I walked a lot, but, you know, when it came time, when I had my own first job, and discovered pizza delivery, you know, guess what I was doing whenever I had the money and, and the time to myself. So, you know, all in all, it was a very stressful childhood. You know, I also remember when she would talk to other people. Now, to make it clear, she never kept friends. It was something she was incapable of doing. She was very, I guess the term is narcissistic, and very insecure, and always had to be conceited with people about how awesome a housekeeper she thought she was. And she did. She kept our places really clean. I don't, I would not say that she was a compulsive cleaner. She would just go through, you know, once a week and, and get everything done. And in the meantime, keep things spot cleaned. But she did have the compulsive drinking and smoking and gambling and, you know, whatever else. So, you know, she would always brag to people she would talk to. Usually, you know, in front of me. And it would be about what a great housekeeper and what a great cook she was. And that wasn't enough. She would always drag me into it. Oh, I'm a, I'm a great housekeeper, aren't I, Kirk? I, I keep a really clean house, don't I? Or I'm a really good cook, aren't I? And when I was really young, I didn't mind, you know, backing her up. Yeah, she makes great food and our house is clean. But... The way she became really made me lose a lot of respect because even though I know that on some level she loved me, she didn't really show it in the way that you would want it to be shown. And Lord help me if I ever wanted to come to her with a problem I was having because she was just unwaveringly negative and judgmental. So I was forced to just kind of find my own way because I wasn't going to get any help there. But, you know, as time wore on and she'd pull that, oh, I'm a great housekeeper, oh, I'm a great cook, I'd be like, well, why don't you invite them over, make them dinner, and let them decide. And a couple of times she really got upset with me for that, but by then, you know, by the time I was 10, 11, 12, Moving up in my, into my teenage years, I, I stopped caring. And uh, there were these times where I was just so tempted to, you know, like you would, pra <laughs> like you would praise a dog, you know, when you're baby talking it. Oh, who's the good doggy? Oh, yes, you're the good doggy. You fetch the ball. Yes, you do. I just wanted to go, oh, who the good housekeeper, oh, who the good cook, oh, yeah, my mommy is, oh. I remember just having that kind of reaction on the tip of my tongue, and instead, 
getting up and walking away because I didn't want to find out what she would do to me when the people were gone. It just wasn't worth it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of what I had to deal with. This is just parts of it. Um, there was more. I mean, once I got old enough to discover <coughs> girls when I was you know, five foot five and weighed about 190 when I should have been 140. I was like the biggest, one of the biggest kids in my school. I remember when I was in Florida, just before I got to Vegas. And I wasn't huge by the standards of what you see today. Now that so many kids and teenagers are obese, you know, a lot of them at that time in my life really make me look like I was a rank amateur but 30 years ago being 40 pounds overweight it really got you a lot of shit if you'll excuse the language um, and I was constantly teased uh, always last pick in PE unless oh unless it was tug of war and then I turned the tables on them I remember saying you know they, they, Everyone was like, ooh, if we get first pick, you gotta go with Kirk. Uh. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I insist on being last. And you got two teams of kids getting worked up in a tiff, pissed off at me. And I'm just like, oh, no, I insist. I'm always last. You gotta make me last here, too. It's only fair. And the instructors just rolling their eyes. You know. <laughs> So, yeah, when, when I started getting interested in girls, I had some really nice first experiences there. Not long before we left Florida, there was a family which we started spending a lot of time over at their place, and my mom would drink with them because both of those guys, that couple, they were alcoholics as well and so was their teenage son and they had a daughter who was my age like 12 13 and built like she was 20 that's all I'm gonna say she was stunningly drop-dead curvy gorgeous and you know of course I've got a crush the size of uh, Texas on this girl but I knew we were moving and everything anyway, and I didn't have the nerve to ask anybody out and, you know, to date or whatever, and so I just never said or did anything. You know, the most we would do was sit and watch MTV videos or, or play the bumper pool table together, and uh, that was about it. But she was a grade behind me so she was still in, in the elementary school and I was in the junior high and they shared a building and there was a kid in the junior high that she had a crush on who was one of the lunch line volunteers he uh, helped serve out the school lunches every day and she knew that I saw him so she wrote this little love letter to him and folded it up and gave it to me and I promised I would pass it to him. I didn't care, you know. But, and, and I wasn't going to read it. If she would have just handed it to me folded up, I would not have read it. But then she was like, she didn't have an envelope, so she put a staple through the middle of the folded paper. Actually, she asked for it back and then put the staple through it. She was like, oh, I just want to be sure. That got me thinking, oh, so there's something in here you don't want me to read. What could there be in this note to this other kid you don't want me to read? So she gave it to me on a weekend. I think it was Friday or Saturday evening. And I was going to deliver it Monday, which I did do. But it had this staple through it, and this was after she asked for it back to put the staple through it. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to read the damn letter. And most of it was just, oh, I can't wait to kiss you and see you. And it was really rather sexual, if you 
Don't mind my saying for being written by a 12 year old girl. Uh, she was growing up way too fast and I hope uh, things worked out well for her but given how her parents were and how her brother already was I have to wonder. But I get through all of the syrupy gloppy lovey-dovey stuff and then <coughs> Oh, excuse me. There was this passage in there. Oh, by the way, don't worry about Kirk. He's fat and ugly, and I might see him at my place, but it's you I want. And I, you know that feeling you get when all the color just drops out, and you feel like you have electric current going through your body as you start to turn cold from the face down? That That's kind of what... I felt after I read that and uh, I just put the staple back through the page, folded the staple back shut and gave the kid the note that Monday and that was that. Um, came here to Vegas and things really didn't get any better. So. You know, all those kinds of experiences really walloped my uh, self-esteem. And, geez, I've been going on over 25 minutes. Oh, sorry, people. If you've tuned out by now, I understand perfectly. But there's more that I can talk about. Like, really quickly, um, in my senior year of high school, I managed to pick up my grades enough to get into the vocational high school here to study computers. And I wanted to go to college and, and study more, but I didn't feel like I deserved college even. Uh, I mean, hell, I refused to get a cap and gown and attend the graduation ceremony for high school graduation because I didn't want my mother to be a part of it. Um, that's the honest to God's reason why I didn't want her to be taking me there or going with me there. I didn't want my classmates to see her. She was an embarrassment to me, you know, with the drinking and everything else. And uh, the hours were you know, it seemed like it. Every day I'd come home from school and she would talk about her little fabricated problems. She couldn't pay a bill on time. She had to wait until her check came in so they put on a $3 late fee. Or this neighbor this and this neighbor that and the people on the other side of the duplex this and that. Stuff that really in the grand scheme didn't even matter. Or if it did, it wasn't anything I could do anything about. But I would have to sit there and deal with this or, or take my food back in my room and eat and bar the door. So, you know, there was a scholarship that my computer instructor said there were three of for the school. Thousand dollars a semester, eight semesters, four years. For, excuse me, for UNLV, which a thousand back then in the mid 80s was pretty good. Tuitions weren't through the roof like they are now. And she gave one to a good friend of mine who I'm still in contact with, the second to someone else I knew, and she had the third one there for me and said she would not give it to anybody else, that it would go unclaimed and I refused to take the application because I didn't feel that I deserved a scholarship. And, uh, yeah. And, um, I was passively or actively suicidal for most of my late teens. Uh, when I was 19 and out on my own, at one point I bought a couple of... <clears throat> One second. I had to wet my throat there. 
bought a couple of bottles of Nitol pills and gulped them down one night and it didn't kill me obviously or I wouldn't be sitting here right I uh, didn't even end up hospitalized but I did recover entirely on my own and it took over a week to get even a little bit of my strength back plus I was dehydrated and getting close to starvation because I didn't have the energy to get up and eat for days or drink and uh, that was the one time that I did that and thankfully there haven't been any more and uh, yeah that's about it I guess that's all the major points that I can touch on about uh, how I ended up addicted to food and using it for comfort when it didn't seem like there was really anything else or maybe there were other things and I was incapable of perceiving them uh, plus I had a lot of body image issues you know especially after the first crush and that really horrible comment in her little love letter um, it took years for me to be able to just kind of let that go and other things besides but uh, that's kind of how I ended up becoming a compulsive eater and uh, it, the link that eating and depression had for me um, I'm curious as to what other people's stories are what they've been through how they uh, got entrenched in overeating and got out of it. I know on the McDougal forums a lot of people have talked about this kind of stuff, at least in a little bit of detail. And that's the nice thing about following the McDougal plan is that the food you're eating is generally so low in calories that even if you do overstuff yourself beyond satisfied and in the full you know, overdoing it, you're not taking in a lot of fat calories and a lot of excess calories that add up fast. It, it can't hurt you um, unless, I guess, you really make a go at it. But Dr. McDougall does address volume eating in at least one of his uh, articles on the website, possibly in a video as well. And he basically says that as long as you're overeating McDougal compliant foods, starches and vegetables and fruits, you're not going to get very fat even if you do get a little bit. And overall your health is going to be many, many fold times better than if you're binging on junk food. So, you know, while I've been on this journey, I've been depressed. There have been times where I've been close to just throwing up my hands and saying, screw it. Because we've had a lot of environmental and financial challenges throughout this whole time. And it, it gets very frustrating, very depressing, and you feel like you're powerless to do anything about it. Excuse me. And in a lot of ways, really, we are. Um, you know, Jeanette can't steal a job at gunpoint. She's been looking for one for the longest time and isn't having any luck. So that sucks. I mean, if we had another income coming in, we'd be doing so much better. And we could change a lot of things we need to change, but we can't. And sometimes I really just get to the point where I don't know what to do. And I might go off the tracks a little bit. It hasn't been happening much lately, but back uh, last year, oh boy. Um, I was eating a lot of junk from the dollar store and most of it wasn't meat or, you know, animal products. It was just a lot of cheap refined carbs. But for every time I would go off the wagon, I'd get back on for two, three days and try to maintain my commitment. And for a period of months where 
prior times I would have gained 50, 60, 100 pounds, maybe more, just eating all the, the standard American junk food kind of stuff, pizza all the time, and fast food all the time, and I'd have gained a ton of weight. Well, over this period where I was having a very rough go, at the end of it I was still four pounds lighter, which was a first by a long shot at any point in my life. So I guess my message is, if you're stressed, if you're having self-esteem problems, if you are having financial difficulties and, and you're weighed down by it, it's still possible to eat very cheaply on the starches and the vegetables, and even if you're just buying frozen vegetables and stuff like that. And you can eat for comfort and eat if you're stressed, and it's virtually impossible to continue gaining weight or to gain weight. And if you're big and, and struggling to lose weight, you actually probably will even during the stressful times. So my 35 plus minutes of rambling, if you don't take anything else away from it, take that. And uh, for here, I'll go ahead and stop. When I come back in my next video, I'll talk a little more about body image things and how at one point in my life, when I was this close, 235, uh, very active, riding a bike all over the place, walking miles at a time, and when I sat down, I just had the tiniest little belly pouch, you know, another 15 pounds I'd have been right where I needed to be, maybe 20 at, at the most. But even at that point in my life where I was just this close to being an ideal weight, there were just things that kind of happened that, that I continued to believe that I was the, you know, fattest, ugliest thing on two feet. I didn't realize what I had until I let it go and then by you know, about five years later I saw 300 again and never got back below it until what I'm going to do here in another uh, two, three, four weeks I think. First time in half my life. So that's it for this video. Uh, again I apologize for going on. I hope you stuck around. Um, hope I didn't bore you to tears. And uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.